welcome to March to the Pod, presented by Eternal Roofing. We are currently the only podcast designed to exclusively talk about the Sam Houston Bearcats. In this episode, Ben will hopefully provide a good update on the Cats' offense after their second scrimmage. We're going to give the defense some love with its own segment, and Ben's going to close us out by providing some analysis of the women's soccer they had a, a weekend split and then preview this week's soccer and volleyball games. It is go time. Ben, I'm your host, Corey Hope, the non-FBS insider at Dave Campbell's Texas Football. Find me on your favorite social media channels, at Corey Hoag Sports. It's all one word, C-O-R-Y-H-O-G-U-E, sports. I'm joined by the creator and manager of Sports of SHSU, also one word, on Twitter and Instagram, the chief operating officer of the Cat Fund, and a proud Bearcat alum, Ben Sorrells. Ben, it really is go time. We had games. We have action to talk about for the first time in our podcast history. Yeah, man. It was a lot of fun. Uh, weekend split for soccer uh, and a split for volleyball, even though that was a scrimmage. So, yeah, we're running. And uh, I believe we've got some big news as well. You kind of said a little bit about it there in the opening, but some big news this week for us as well. Oh my goodness, we had a great week. And, and you know, we're going to we're going to spend a lot of time on this podcast bragging on our listeners, uh especially today. But I really want to brag on one. Uh Matt Saint Amour, I believe is how you say his name. If I messed it up, I do apologize. Uh he was he was very instrumental in hooking us up with uh, Taylor Andrus over at Eternal Roofing and we have if you haven't seen the announcement on social media, you're hearing it for the first time. We are very proud to announce a partnership with Eternal Roofing and General Contracting. It is another Bearcat alum. Honestly, I when I I did a little research when I first heard about them, and when as I was doing the research, I just came away impressed, Ben. It is a company that is run right and tailor is the epitome of the kind of boss you want. He's just a good guy. Yeah, that's the first thing I was going to say. Great guy. And I think it's really cool that he's a Bearcat alumni, which I think is really cool because we're a Bearcat sports podcast. And so that connection is a lot of fun. Great company. We want to support local businesses um, in the Houston and Hill Country area. And so we're super excited to have him on board. And we are. And we're going to get to them a little bit more here as we as we go through. You're going to hear a whole lot about Eternal Roofing and, and what they provide. And I'll just give you a quick little breakdown here since – Hey, this is how we're opening our show today. We are very, very proud to be partnered with Eternal Roofing. They are commercial and residential roofing and general contracting services throughout the Hill Country and Houston area, just like Ben said. They give you free detailed roof inspections, fast professional service, no high-pressure sales pitch. They have exceptional workmanship warranties. Ben, the more I read about this company, the more I just... I'm so happy that uh, we have that attachment with this podcast and that attachment also, like you said earlier, includes the Bearcats. I think that connection is very important. It is. And I think it's a company that can help people. Obviously, right now with it being hurricane season, you never know what's going to pop up. You never know when um, you might need a new roof or roof repair. So I think it's a really good time to come on board. And yeah, it's a really well-run company. Taylor's a great guy. And uh, this is just the beginning of a really exciting partnership. Ben, you're right, and, and we couldn't be more excited, more happy to talk and be partnered with Eternal Roofing and tell you more about that great company as we go along. Look, we are a podcast on the Republic of Football Network and an extension of Dave Campbell's Texas Football. Please like and subscribe to the podcast and follow us on the various social media platforms, including Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and threads at March to the Pod, all one word, March the number two, the pod please follow us on there like subscribe share on the apple or wherever you spotify megaphone where wherever you get pod bean i think is one wherever you get yep. it from that's what i'm telling you go hit subscribe like follow share and also a special hello to those on the dave cables youtube page watching us how are you we hope you had a fantastic week uh and you know, hopefully, speaking of a, a fantastic week, we really hope you had one, and I hope that Ben is bringing back some good news. This was the second scrimmage for the Bearcats. I believe it's the final one before they break camp, or they have one more. 
Yeah, that was the final one uh, of camp. So there might be a little more live stuff over the next two weeks. But as far as camp goes, that was the final official scrimmage. Okay. Well, now we know. So listen, last week, man, it was rough, right? I went back and listened to some of that, and I was like, oh, man, the offense really didn't sound good. So, so Ben, we're coming to you today, and we're asking, please bring us some good news. Last season, man, that was hard to watch sometimes. Please tell us that we got we got something good. So, yeah, so some better news to report from the second scrimmage, which I think is what we were hoping for and kind of expecting. So um, some good news there. The offense did look a lot better, especially at the beginning. I think they scored on four of their first five drives, and both Keegan um, and Grant looked really good. Um, scored multiple touchdowns led multiple touchdown drives and so that was good and then at the end of uh, the scrimmage the the offense and the defense were going back and forth on uh, who won the scrimmage and they were debating so Keeler flipped a coin I think the offense took took the scrimmage based on a coin flip so um, a lot better vibes around the scrimmage the offense looked a lot better was really competitive Um, and yeah I think it was really good and a good way to end camp so uh, two weeks to BYU a little less than two weeks now and it's getting it's getting real it is. It is getting real. And uh, so you said there was a coin flip as yeah. to who was who it was, right? Who won it? Does that mean, and I'm going to test my theory that we we put out last week, does that mean there were very few, if any, scuffles or tempers flaring during the, during the scrimmage? Yeah, everything was good. And it was honestly a really clean scrimmage. Keeler talked about that um, in our in the interview after the scrimmage, talked about how the guys played clean, um, not turning the ball over. So, yeah, it was good. It, a lot of good competition, kept it clean, not a lot of penalties. Um, so a big improvement from the first week. And Keeler also talked about that in his uh, interview after the scrimmage. So all in all, really good days uh, of work. And, um, yeah, I think the team's pleased with how that second scrimmage went. I'm glad you mentioned that Keeler interview because you you conducted an interview with him. You put it out uh, on on the Sports of SHSU Twitter account, and uh, we're going to play that. We're going to play that clip here. Believe it or not, Corey is learning some digital stuff, Ben, with this whole podcasting <laughs> thing that that they got going on. I'm I'm learning a few things out here, Ben. Yeah, I mean, I'm forcing your hand. I'm getting this video. Let's let's see it in there. I'm excited. <laughs> but, you know what? I'm I, I'm not going to call you this because she would probably get upset. But you're not. It, it is similar to what my wife does to me. Always forcing me to get better. And I, you know, I, at some point, I think I'm going to have to push back. Hey, somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to. <laughs> somebody has to. It takes a lot for like me, man. Me. <laughs> it takes a lot. Let's get back into the Bearcats. Uh, there were some players that uh, weren't in that scrimmage uh, the other day, and, and I think it was more precautionary, or they already had a spot sewn up, so they needed to see competition. What do you got? Yeah, it, it was strictly precautionary. I actually had a chance to talk to Coach Rocco beforehand um, when I showed up to the scrimmage because I saw a couple guys weren't playing a couple of the notable guys, probably five to seven of them. And I was like, I really hope they're not all injured. And, and that was the case that, that they're all fine. They're good. But uh, it was a matter of what he said. Let's just get them to Saturday. We got to get them to Saturday. These are our guys. These are the guys we're dependent on. Um, we got to limit the hits on these guys. They know their roles. They know what they're doing. So um, yeah, there were about five to seven notable names on both sides of the ball that weren't in there, but it was strictly just precautionary and everything's good there. Let's let's put that into a phrase that maybe some people can understand that, you know, why that would happen. Relate it to the last scrimmage of every NFL preseason. You don't if you see now this it is a little different. I let's let me clarify. It's a little different now that there's three and not four. But mm-hmm. when there was four, there it was always the starter would play a quarter, then the starter would play a half, starter would play a three quarters half to three quarters in the last game none of the players who you could not get hurt for lack of a better term didn't play and i think that's what because it's two things number one you accomplish that no one's going to get hurt that you really are relying on this year so that's a good thing and the second thing it does it allows the coaching staff an opportunity to settle on some of those backups and give some of those backups a final chance to really make an impression to get some playing time and that's really important it is it's it's really the best of both worlds and i think like you said you get to kind of figure out 
who's going to be that last starter at whatever position it might be, who's going to be um, the last guy on the bus on special teams. Um, and then you get to keep your guys healthy. There were even some guys that played the first half of the scrimmage that didn't play the back half, similar to a preseason game in the NFL. So, um, yeah, I, I think that was to be expected. And all the guys that either played in a limited role or didn't play at all, they're fine. They'll be good to go. It was just strictly precautionary. Yeah, and look, I'm I, I uh, I'm pretty sure you're going to see the same way as I do, but I have no problem with Keeler doing that because the players already know. It, if these players are being held out, everybody on the team knows that's a start. Yep. Yeah, and, and all the guys that held out were your mainstays. I mean, it was an Ethan Hagler, Ife Day, Isaiah Downs kind of guy. All guys that were there from the national championship teams, guys that know their roles. So, um, yeah, nothing to be concerned about. And guys know that that those are our guys we're going to depend on, and we need them healthy throughout this season. Well, now, Ben, we're going to move into what people actually want to hear us talk about right now, and that's that quarterback battle. But before we get started on the quarterback battle, I want to take a minute and play Keeler's interview that you gave uh, there during after that scrimmage, and then we'll discuss that here at, when uh, when we get back. Here with Sam Houston head football coach Casey Keeler. Keeler, scrimmage number two in the books. What are just some of your initial thoughts after today? Yeah, much better than, than last week. You know, what a difference a week a week makes. We really took a, a concerted effort in practice to make it more game-like. Uh, you could see that that paid off today. Um, I thought, uh, you know, tempo was good, intensity was good. Um, you know, we, we used the pits. We used a lot of special teams things that, you you know, you don't you know normally do like unless you, until you get to a game. So I thought, uh, thought the effort was good. thought uh, we did a good job by taking care of the ball, which was a problem last week. And all in all, you know, happy coming off of a scrimmage too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, obviously, everyone knows about the quarterback battle between Gunnell and Shoemaker. What have you liked from both guys? And do you guys have a timeline on when you might want to name a starter? Yeah, by, the, by coin flip, I'd like to have a starter. I, you know, I've done this so many different ways. I think that both, both guys are battling. Um, I, I don't think the offense really runs differently with one guy in versus the other guy being in. Um, I thought they both took steps forward today. Uh, you know, I love their poise. You know, both of the guys are really, really poised. They do not get rattled. Um, they're both great leaders. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's good to feel like you have two guys you can go uh, open and open a day with. Yeah. And obviously two weeks away from BYU now, two weeks exactly. What have you seen from them on film and have you had a chance to look at them yet? Well, they're big and physical. You know, they're going to be a little different defensively because a new defensive coordinator have a number of transfers on the defensive side of the ball also. I think statistically they weren't very good last year defensively. You can see they've done a, a really good job uh, increasing the talent on that side of the ball. Um, you know, offensively, you know, it's a lot of the same guys coming back, different quarterback, really talented, was, uh, you know, freshman of the year in the Pac-12 uh, when he was at USC. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they, they, they are a little different because um, um, they've uh, you know, spent some money, you know, on the portal and, and NLIs and those kind of things. But, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be playing, you know, BYU a night game at their place at 8.15 at night. I mean, this is, uh, this is what college football is all about. We're excited about it. Yep. And then final one, obviously a ton of new guys this year. What have you all tried to do to maintain that culture, maintain that standard you've always talked about with so many new players? Yeah, culture, you know, it, it shifts, you know, day by day and player by player and year by year. So uh, we do a lot of talking about, like, you know, this is how we got here. This is how we won a national championship. This is how we won 21 straight games. This is how we had the greatest season in the history of college football by winning 21 and three conference championships and a national championship in 10 months. That was hard to do, but how did we do that? And we talk about you know the culture things that we've done in the past and and um, you know what we're doing now. And so um, a lot of that, also a lot of team bonding and building stuff in, in our team meetings, um, really getting to know each other. And so uh, again, um, this is more than just playing football. This is trying to create uh, a unit a team that's going to go, you know, play to the every, to the very end in, in every contest. Yep. All right, Ben. Well, that was Casey Keeler. Ben, you recorded that at the second scrimmage uh, on Saturday, and so I, I found that very interesting. I'm interested what you think. Yeah, especially on the quarterback battle. Um, he said he wants to know a guy by coin flip. Um, I think the public will know a guy by coin flip. I think internally. Um, they're probably going to name something here in about a week. Um, I don't think they're going to decide something the moment they run out on the field for the first drive. So um, I think it's something that's going to be kind of a mystery to the public, mystery to BYU, something they're going to have to game plan for two quarterbacks. And so um, I think that's what it's going to look like for us. But I think internally, and we talked a little bit about this off the air, I think internally 
Um, yeah, I think they're going to probably name something within a couple of days of game time, within a week of game time. Um, so we'll see. We'll see that. It was really interesting to kind of hear him say that, that it's, he'll, they'll name it that coin flip. But um, yeah, it's really just a wait and see for us as the public. <laughs> it, it, I do have a couple questions on this because he, he mentioned in there about how the offense doesn't change much with either quarterback in there. So does that really provide the Bearcats any advantage not naming the starter? Yeah, I, I think it could provide an advantage a little bit. I, I think the offensive playbook is going to stay the same. I think the one thing that might change a little bit is Keegan is able to run the ball a little bit more. So you might be able to use his legs a little more in some packages. Um, but that's really the only change. And so I think it could be an advantage kind of sitting on whoever the starter is and not naming it publicly. Um but yeah, a little bit of an advantage. And I like I agree with what he says. I think the only the only little change there might be is Keegan uses his legs a little more than Grant does. Okay. So we were talking off air before we came in. And some of us that have that have followed the Bearcats for a few years have seen this song and dance from Coach mm-hmm. Keeler. Right? We we've watched him a couple of years ago say he didn't know who the quarterback was gonna be. And well, we didn't know. The team knew who the quarterback was going to be when Eric Schmidt was hurt a couple of years ago. I believe they were going in to play SFA at NRG Stadium. But we didn't know until right before the game who was going to be the starter. You think this is kind of just same song, just don't want to give it away just yet? Or or is it really that close of a battle? That's, That's where I want to find out here. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I, I really don't think he wants to name anyone until game time. We saw that last year with Jordan Yates and Keegan Shoemaker. We saw it with the 2021 Battle of the Piney Woods. I mean, the team knew within a couple of days of the game that Schmidt wasn't playing, but nobody on the outside knew that. And so I think it's a little bit of both. Internally, I don't really think there is a starter right now, but we're still about two weeks out from the game. I think they'll know here soon. I think it is a really close battle. Um, it's still up for grabs. I could still see either guy winning it. Um, so I think it's a little bit of both. I, I think it's playing into a strategy that they've used a couple times in the past and then also really just trying to figure out who the best guy is. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see who it is. I also want to give uh, Coach Keeler credit because when they do this stuff, which he has done it multiple times, as we've said, Nobody spills it, man. He knows how to keep that room in there tight. And that is something not a lot of coaches do. Uh, you know, they're they're usually one of us. If if you got, you know, we know a few coaches on the staff or something, we'll get a little text sometimes. You get nothing from players, coaches, nothing from him. He he is really good about keeping that bond t- together. He is, especially at the QB position. Um, yeah, we'll get some information on other stuff, but when it comes to the QB position, that's classified. Um, it's not going to get out there, um, and we've seen that in the past. So, And that goes back to Keeler as a strategist, and we've talked about this a lot the last couple of weeks and kind of the strategy behind Keeler and what he does and how he does um, his game plan and put stuff together. So I'm not surprised at all. And even if they had a starter name today, I don't think we would know for two weeks and it would be classified. So it's just classic Keeler and playing into his strategy. He's a master tactician. And uh, you know what? We love it because it, it led to a national title and it's led to a whole lot of wins and a whole lot of success. So man, that's one of it, it's honestly an appreciation And I think what also I like about it is that you and I, he understands our job and we're going to keep poking to try to see if we can get something right. He understands the nature of that. And I think he enjoys that to some extent. I don't know if he'd enjoy me just sending him a random text every single day. Uh, (laughs) But, you know, I think he enjoys some of that little back and forth with it, too. Yeah, and he's consistent with what he says too. I mean, the he had a podcast. He was on a podcast with the school today with Jason Barfield that the athletic department released, and he gave almost the exact answer he gave me word for word um, a couple days ago. So he he knows what he's talking about. He's going to be consistent with it. And like I said, it's it's classified whether they know it now or whether they know it in uh, the the day of the game. We're not going to know. I feel like until they they announce the starters right before kickoff. He knows how to do a message. He knows how to give the same message. And I'm hoping that some of our listeners, when they hear our message every single week, that they start and that it motivates them to start donating to something like the cat fund, Ben, because 
we're entering a new era. This is we're in Conference USA. It has started. There's more funding needed. There's more everything all over. We got projects going on. But the CAT fund is one of these that every dollar goes right back into the student athlete. And it's used to give those that are that have been loyal to Sam Houston some help at times. I think honestly, Ben, I you know, for those that mega donors we've talked before, go give to the to the school. For those of us who just want to help people, because I, I really feel there's a lot that are like me. We just want to help people. This is a way you can help these kids and show them your appreciation on top of being at every single game. Yeah, it's a great way to help these kids, like you said, and reward a lot of guys who have stuck around and been here for a couple of years and help these programs get to where they are. And um, you as a member get some benefits, too. I mean, you get access to some really cool stuff and and, uh, and merchandise and apparel. So that's really cool. And you get to support these athletes and it all goes right back to them, which is what it's all about. So, um, yeah, I highly recommend it. Really, anybody can get in on it. It's 10 bucks a month to start. Um, so yeah, really great way to get involved, support the cats and also, um, have a couple benefits on your end too. So it's the best of both worlds. Exactly. Look, you, you support the cats and talking about supporting the cats. We had a, a few talks with uh, Taylor Andrus at eternal roofing and nobody supports the cats quite like he does. He, he is outstanding. Listen, eternal roofing, they can install, repair your roof. They can paint the interior or exterior of your home or business, install gutters or garage doors. They can install floors, perform any woodworking need, crown molding, shelf work, whatever you've got. They can repair your sheetrock. If you've got someone who, like me, I put my hip through some sheetrock uh, when I was young. You know, my dad did not appreciate that. Eternal roofing could come out there, and they're not going to discipline your kid that broke the sheetrock, but they can fix it for you. Right. And then you got the choice. They are the choice, Ben. You might not know this, but they are the choice when you need Christmas lights installed. And we know how big a thing that has become. You need to call eternal roofing on that. Yeah. And, and I'm glad they're doing it because if I did it, it wouldn't look very good. So yeah, eternal roofing, that's, that's the place to go. So guys like us don't have to. <laughs> yeah. And they're all over the hill country and Houston. They've got two offices. Uh, they've got an office in the hill country. You can reach that one at uh, number 830-251-5673. That was 830-251-5673. Or they have an office in Montgomery at 936-215-8539 is the number that will get you there. One more time, that's 936-215-8539. Or if you're one that just wants to email, if you're in your car, you could, hey, Siri, and email. And if I just started that, I want to apologize because my phone did. <laughs> ben, I just my phone just responded when I said that. So anyone driving, I do apologize. <laughs> You could speak to that person on your phone <laughs> and tell them to email taylor at eternalroofingtx.com, T-A-Y-L-O-R at eternalroofingtx.com. Hey, maybe next time I'll just do that again and make, make that uh, person come up and then tell them to email taylor at eternalroofingtx.com and give me some things about the about what you do, man, because we need some help. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, saying that, hey, Siri, and given the email address, you might be sending emails from, from the podcast to people's phones. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> we did it again, man. We got to stop that. That's <laughs> somebody <laughs> driving going, dang, nabbit, man, stop. <laughs> hey, again, man, it, I, I also want to throw this in there too, because I was, again, I go through their site, I was doing some research. They use certain teed shingles. You talk about quality stuff, Ben. They use certain teed shingles. Those are known for their superior weather resistance, exceptional longevity, and they're they're just stunning when you see them on a roof. Certain teed shingles is what they use. Man, I tell you, you talk about a company that gives you the best product, the best service, and the best people. It really is Eternal Roofing. There's only one place to go, and that's Eternal Roofing. Yeah, Taylor and his team do a great job. And, uh, yeah, make sure he, him and his team do it so you don't have to. Uh, <laughs> let the professionals take care of it because I know, like I said, I'm not the guy to do it. I'm sure a lot of people aren't, but their team is. Yes, yes, and that is not me either. I am not. Uh, we 
No, I do watch Christmas Vacation, though. That's all I got. Anyway, Ben, we have <laughs> talked a lot about the Bearcats offense. An enormous amount. And you know who hadn't gotten any love? The defense, man. We need we need to know about this defense right here. Tell us a little bit about what you've seen from them here during camp in the first couple of scrimmages. So during camp, it, it's really been a, a group that's lived up to expectation, I would say. Um, I think we all know that the defense, especially the front seven, is the strength that this team has going into FBS play and what they're going to rely on going into FBS play. And for the most part, really everything that I've seen, they've lived up to it. And I think it's going to be really exciting. We're going to get into it more here in a little bit, but um, that front seven, I think it's probably the best we've ever had. Um, and then that secondary, it doesn't get a lot of love because the front seven is so good, but there's some names there that people need to know that they might not know. And I think there's some depth there. Um, so I think it's a really good group. And um, like I said, I think it's the strength of this team and it's going to be a lot of fun to see how they hold up in FBS play after a really dominant couple of years in the FBS or FCS. That sounds great, but man, I need names. I yeah. need to know who we got coming back. Who is on this front seven who are these DBs, man? Fill us in so that when we're watching them beat BYU in a couple of weeks, I de- yeah, guys, I'm feeling fine. When we watch the Bearcats <laughs> beat BYU in a couple of weeks, I want to know their names. Yeah, for sure. So let's just start with the big boys up front, and we'll start with – I think you got to start with Akeem Meatball Smith. I mean, you can't think of a much better nickname, and he's actually listed as Meatball Smith on the roster. And, I mean, that's going to make those all-name teams, and I've already seen it happen, but – Yeah, he's a guy that transferred in from Georgia State um, and has just looked really, really good. Reminds me and a lot of people of what Joe Wallace did for this team during the national championship run. He's going to be there at that nose tackle position. And he was an all Sunbelt guy a couple of years ago at Georgia State. So he's proved it at this level. And man, does he look good uh, filling up the middle there on that D-line. So he's the first name to know. Uh, I I got a question. I'm I'm going to break in here because inquiring minds want to know if Ben has found out yet why he is nicknamed Meatball. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know. And I've had a good amount of interactions with Meatball. He's a he's a good guy, um, great guy, really a, a leader. Um, but yeah, I haven't asked where it's come from. I think he's always had the nickname. And I think the team has really let him kind of play into it, um, which I think is a lot of fun. I don't see a problem with it. Hey, I'm um, intrigued. I just want to I, I just have questions always. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I do too. I mean, and I've talked to him a couple of times. I just think it's fun. I don't think anything of it. It's kind of just become normal at this point. Like, yeah, that's Meatball. I mean, that's who he is. It's Meatball. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, all right, back on track to get into some of the other uh, notable players that uh, we should know. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so behind Meatball at that nose tackle position is Chris Scott. Chris has done a great job providing depth these past couple of years, starting with the national championship team and then the past two years. So he's a guy. And then the two guys on the edge that I think a lot of people know that they're really excited about. One is Markel Perry. We talked about him a couple of weeks ago. A guy I think is being underrated right now. Um, he's just an animal. Um, three or four tackles for loss in the one game he played against a and last year. So he's going to be a lot of fun. And then on the other side, it's Javon Leon. Um, a guy that's really put up incredible numbers, another guy that redshirted last year um, coming off the other edge. And so um, in that 3-3-5, 4-2-5 kind of multiple look that they have, when you've got those three or four guys down there, uh, I think you feel really good. And the two other names I'll throw out real quick. Uh, First one is Jaden Phillips, um, had a really good two years at New Mexico, um, was on the all-freshman team at New Mexico um, in the Mountain West, I believe, had 20 or 30 tackles as a freshman. And then the other one is Seth Mason, a guy with a ton of experience from ULM, um, and it's proven he can do it at the at the FBS level. Um, so I think you've got a lot of really good depth there, especially on the edge. Um, and that's where it all starts is up front. If they can get pressure, I mean, I think this defense could be really good. Man, I like to hear that. Okay, but now it's time to put you on the spot. Okay. I got a question here. I want to know where will this defense rank in program history? What are we going to be watching this year, Ben? Yeah. So from a talent perspective, I think this is the most talented defense we've had in school history. Um, And I think the past couple of years have been the most talented defenses we've seen. And this is probably the best defensive run we've had probably in school history. We've seen it's a big reason why they won the national title. So from a talent perspective, I think it's the best. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what it looks like jumping up 
to the FBS level. I think they were ranked by ESPN as the 72nd best defense, so right in the middle of the pack of the 133 teams. And I think if they can finish at that 70-72 mark, that's really impressive for your first year as an FBS team. And um, I think that would be probably the most impressive defense we've had in our school history. You ever want to see media give you respect for what you've done? That's what they did for Casey Keeler in that defense. We got to, we got to, we're going to pause. We're going to take a, a trip back down memory lane for a minute uh, because Corey knows there's been a few stories written about this over the years on texasfootball.com. Uh, I've probably written one or two. I'm sure Shahan and, and Craven have also written these. It's, the respect they're showing when you have basically that's an FCS defense, right? That, that's basically what that is. And they're saying that um, this defense is middle of the pack in the FBS. And five, six years ago, no one would have said that. And they had a prolific offense. They were outscoring people, but they were, they were getting murdered when the playoffs late in the playoffs, when they faced good teams and, and Casey Keeler said, we're going to switch it. We're gonna change it. We're gonna go where we're gonna go fast, but we're gonna give we're gonna let our defense be good. We got better players. And man, that that transition to do that, to be self-aware to do that, and then for the whole program to just buy into it and go, not only led to a national title, but that really is like the ultimate respect when they put you right in the middle of the FBS teams. Yeah, and I think it's yeah, I think it's been a couple of years in the making, and it's something that was a conscious effort by the athletic department by Casey Keeler and his staff. I remember, I think it was 2016 or 2017. They had just got blown out at James Madison or North Dakota state once again. And Casey Keeler went to Bobby Williams and said, we have to have a full-time strength coach for football only. And, and he got that. Um, and then they made a conscious effort to recruit differently on the defensive line, um, get bigger, faster, stronger, and make that more of an emphasis and not just play with speed the entire time. They did that. And it, it took a couple of years. There were some bumps. I know in 2018 and 2019, they didn't make the playoffs, but um, we saw in that 2020, 2021 season, it paid off. And um, I, I think it was definitely worth it. And I think it's a big reason why even the team got an invite to Conference USA. I mean, if we don't win the national championship, are we on the level that Conference USA is looking at a school like us? And we don't win that title without making that change back in 16, 17, 18 to become bigger on the D-line and hire a strength coach. So, um, yeah, it, it's something a lot of people might look at as minor, but I think it's changed the trajectory of this program and even the school by getting bigger and better on the defensive line and the linebacking group. And it wasn't easy. And it's probably a good thing this podcast was not going uh, back then weekly because the production on the field was not the best. Uh, it, the wins, the win loss record, what now injuries played a role back then and other things, but we didn't know until after that kind of transition was getting to the completion stage of what they were actually doing behind the scenes with that program. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said, in, in 18 and 19, once they kind of made that decision, you didn't really see the fruits of it. Um, those first two years, I mean, you didn't make the playoffs either year. And so people will question it, but you got to give it time. I mean, it, you recruit a freshman class, it's going to take them a couple of years to develop. And so you get those guys, you develop them for a couple of years and you saw what they did and what they're still doing. Some of them are still around from that group that was first there when the strength coach got implemented and that kind of recruiting philosophy changed. And so it's really tra changed the trajectory of the program. It really did. And you want to know what, what changes my opinion sometimes of a place, Ben? What's that? When I see a place that's well-rounded, we've talked about eternal roofing. We know they know roofs. Roof, roofs are in their name, man, but they are specialists also in the commercial side of roofing. Eternal roofing has the ability to accommodate the HVAC system. You see that? You got all these things on the roof. You go to a roof of a business, they got all this equipment. They work around that stuff. They minimize disruption to your operations while they're doing the installation and or repair of it. And, and go to their website, eternalroofingtx.com. They have a gallery there of past projects. And Ben, I don't know if you've looked at them, but just in the month of June, it is some beautiful jobs they've done. The, the workmanship and the quality is just spectacular. 
It is. And like you said, there's so many different things that they can do. I mean, I'm, I feel like I got to scroll for a while just to see all the different services you, that they can do. And even Christmas lights, I didn't even know about that one till today. Um, but I, I see it on there now. So yeah, definitely a versatile group and they can do a lot and uh, definitely the place to go. If you need anything, flooring, roofs, repair, whatever it is, we know, we know storms come through. We know things happen. We know life happens. Give Give Taylor at Eternal Roofing a, a call and give him an email. Send him an email, Taylor at, it's all one word, T-A-Y-L-O-R, at EternalRoofingTX.com. Visit EternalRoofingTX.com. They have a contact us section. You can fill that out. Taylor's pretty quick about getting back with a lot of stuff, especially for a man as busy as he is. He gets back in a, a remarkably fast uh, time frame, especially when you consider how slow I am to respond a lot of times, Ben. <laughs> no, nah, you're not slow to respond, but Taylor Taylor is not slow to respond either. Yeah, every contact we've had with him and from what we know, he he's great and we'll get back to you and his team will get back to you as soon as possible. And uh, yeah, Taylor at uh, Eternal Roofing. Yeah. Yes. Eternal Roofing TX. X. Yes. Got to got to remember the TX there at yeah. the end of the email. Look, man, I also want to say that this, not only is he a Bearcat alum, but he understands the reason for Texas, man. Texas is a special place. We're just going to break off script again. Thank you, Taylor. You got me going. Texas is a special place. We love the state of Texas. We love the Bearcats. The fact that he put the TX at the end of Eternal Roofing, to me, says that man was born, raised, and will always be a Texan. And that's the way it should be. That as, is as it should right. be. Nothing better than Texas, that's for sure. That is right, and there is nothing better than a win in your first game of the athletic program. History at Conference USA School, the women's soccer team produced that. They came back and they beat Prairie View A&M 4-2 on Friday. Uh, it was a, a brilliant second half. They dropped a 3-1 decision. It sounded like maybe some fatigue played a little bit uh, Sunday morning against uh, Louisiana Monroe, but, hey, you don't want to hear what I have to say. You want to hear what Ben has to say. Ben, how how do you rate their performance? And I want to know around the fact that it was likely the hottest game in Sam Houston Athletics history. That was a little bit of a talking thing between Cat fans and, and you guys. It's, it was very – it was fun to read. I enjoyed it. Uh, the hottest home game, hottest weekend. I, I, I mean, the ladies came out with a split. I think we got to be happy with that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a team that, like we talked about, is kind of still in a rebuild mode, maybe looking at middle of the pack conference USA. And I was happy with this weekend's performance. I think Prairie View was the game that they should have won in which they did a um, little bit of a slow start um, down two nothing at the half. But I thought it was interesting. They were up six to two in shots at halftime um, of that first game, but they were down two nothing. So um, we knew they were going to break through and, and eventually they did. They scored four goals in that second half and, and got the win. That was a game they should have won. And then um, that second game, ULM, I mean, they were a team that went 10, six and three last year. So it's a good team. And up until that 75th, 76th minute, it was tied there at one, one. Um, they scored twice there towards the end. ULM did, and um, they got a win, but I've got a really interesting stat. Um, Ooh. when it comes to this weekend, I like um, stats. Yeah. So the team scored five goals this weekend, four goals against Prairie View, one against ULM. Corey, do you know how many goals they scored last year total? Total. Yeah. I don't know offhand, but with that kind of a question, you're not going to get a high number. I I'm going to yeah. go with, we're going to go 10, I think 50% of the total. So they scored nine total goals last Ooh. season. So when I tweeted the other night, uh, especially after the Prairie View game, that I feel like this program's headed in the right direction, I really do. Five goals in two games, a, one of them a game that you should have won, um, and another a game that was a toss-up, maybe a team that was favored. Uh, but you scored five goals, um, and you scored nine all of last season. And so I really feel like this team is headed in the right direction. Um, and we saw some good stuff, putting shots on goal, being competitive there till the very end against a pretty good ULM team. So uh, definitely feel like we're moving in the right direction. And five goals is a big step forward from, from where we were last year at this point. It is. It's huge. And we need to celebrate each one of those steps. Uh, but, you know, Ben – it can't always be positive, and I want to know, they gave up five goals. 
They scored five. They gave up five. Uh, do you think that's something in the back line with the defense? Was that a back line issue or what, what is it with the defense that they allowed so many goals? Yeah, I, I think it's hard to tell because we didn't really have a video feed and we, we weren't able to make the game. So it's a little bit difficult to tell, but this early in the season, I, I think there is going to be a little bit of issue there on defense with communication. You haven't played a ton. You're going to get tired. Um, I think these games are going to be a little higher scoring in this heat with how tired the back line is going to get. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell without video. And it's two games, so it really hasn't become a trend just yet. But, um, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Maybe this year we're a high-powered offense and the, the defense is, is a little lacking. Um, but, yeah, we'll see. I mean, there's a lot of season left, and we're just two games in. There is. But after two games – more or less positive right now? I think I know what the answer is here. Yeah, I'm going to say more. Um, I would say about even keel leaning towards more. You took care of business in the game you were supposed to win, Prairie View. Um, and then you look competitive for 75%, 80% of a game against ULM, and that's a team that won 10 games last year. So definitely trending in the right direction. And then you've got a game against Lamar coming up this week, which is, I think, a game that you should win. And if you win that, I think the teams would be feeling really good going into to week three. So they that's the only game they have this week is the game against Lamar? Yep, yep. And is is that one a home game? I don't have the schedule up in front of me. Yeah, let me pull it up. Um, so that I know that's Thursday night at home, and okay. so they're they're gonna play Thursday night. Yeah, Thursday at uh, at home against Lamar. And then they've got a week off until they go to Houston Christian. Um, and this coming game is actually on ESPN Plus. Awesome. Uh, so we'll get we'll get to actually see the team for the first time. So you know what exciting. I want to see, Ben? What's that? I want to see the stands full of Bearcats fans supporting the women's soccer team. It, it's fun, man. I, I actually went to a decent amount of soccer games there at Pritchett Field. It's a kind of a smaller field, closed in environment, um, which makes it a lot of fun. And it looked like there was a pretty good crowd for the opening night against Prairie View, um, that Friday night game. But yeah, when that place gets full, um, it's definitely a lot of fun. And um, fun fact, we'll go off script here. I'm sure you know that the Sam Houston football team played their home games at Pritchett Field until uh, Bower Stadium opened in the 80s. And so the old home old home of Sam Houston football, that place has a lot of history. Ha, I'll surprise you. I did not know that. Yeah, that, that's where they played. <laughs> and I'll give you another fun fact. The uh, the ex, yeah, the old XFL um, back with, I believe it was Jim Kelly, right, playing for the Gamblers, if I'm oh, correct. That wasn't yeah. XFL. Oh, uh, USFL. USFL. Yeah, yeah I, US... I can't remember the team, but yeah. yeah. So the Houston Gambler USFL, they held their preseason training camp at Pritchett Field for two seasons. Nice. Um, and Jim Kelly was there. So, uh, yeah, that, that's a fun fact for you. Random fact about Pritchett Field, home of Sam Houston soccer. It's a fun place. There you go. Hey, look, soccer is always. Soccer is uh, always fun. Soccer is always a fun time. Uh, you know, and when you get out there, soccer crowds. They're, they're into it. You know, I, I have not been to a college soccer game where I haven't sat back and kind of enjoyed some of the crowd. They really get going. They do, yeah. And, and soccer is really uh, – it's a different animal. I mean, you you look at those European crowds. I mean, that's something else. I mean, a lot of fans here, even for NFL games, are just kind of twiddling their thumbs on their phones, not really paying attention. But they're standing, yelling, painting their face. They've got signs. They've got chants. It's – it's fun. And so if we can get that going at Pritchard Field, I think it'd be really cool. That would be awesome. You know, I, there's one other place I need people to be this week, and that's wherever the volleyball team is playing. Last weekend, they had a scrimmage against Houston Christian. Uh, did you see the scrimmage? I didn't see it, but uh, Colin Neal, who does some good work for, for K-Sam, and he's a student reporter with the Houstonian, I believe he's still there again this year. He uh, He live tweeted some of it, and I do know that they tied two sets to two. Um, can't really read too much into that. Really no video. It was a scrimmage. Who knows how much um, your star players were playing on either side. So, yeah, it was a 2-2 tie um, for the first scrimmage. And then, obviously, we've got a big weekend coming up with four games at our famous Bearcat Invitational Tournament. <laughs> the bit. Yeah, the bit. <laughs> it is the weekend for the bit. The bit. We bit you. It's the Bearcat Invitational Tournament. This is it, and we need people at soccer Thursday night, and then we need people at volleyball, 
Is that one also on ESPN Plus for those like me who are not in Huntsville? So four total games, two on Friday, two on Saturday, two on Saturday. The two on Friday are not televised, but the two on Saturday against Portland and a and Corpus are televised. So Friday, no. Saturday, yes. Hey, Friday and Saturday, that's four times to get out there and see the Cats volleyball. You got no reason not to. It's not even – football starts in another week, okay? Go out there, support some soccer, support some volleyball. That's what we want to see. Uh, that is one of the most common th- – one of the easiest things we can do, Ben. Again, I know we're going to mention this a lot. The easiest thing you can do to give back to this program is to go watch their games and cheer on your Cats. Yep, and I think ultimately that's that's what means most of these athletes. When they see the stands full, people yelling and cheering for them, I think that's what really means the most. And I, I, it makes an impact in the way they play and the way these teams play. So definitely recommend getting out there this week, soccer or volleyball or both. Or both or all of it. If you can, if you're not working. Hey, look, I know life happens. We're not sick. But if you can, please get out there and support them. They will appreciate it, and it does help them play better. And also thank you. I want to thank each one of you listeners, viewers, Ben, we're going to brag on them here before we go. I'm going to brag on them a lot over time, but we're really going to brag on them to, we have gotten some numbers finally from, uh, from some of our podcasts. And what we have found out is that we have an amazing listening base and we kind of already knew that, but we really do. And guys, I I just want to tell everybody you already have us up in the top three of all the podcasts on the Republic of Football Network. Top three of 13 FBS podcasts, and that's because of you, the listener. And another one, Ben, this is just straight incredible. Houston is our second largest city of listeners have come from Huntsville, right there. Our second largest come from Huntsville. Bearcats fans, right? That's who's doing 10% comes from San Antonio. Some of that is Alamo, you know, the Alamo Audible uh, UTSA's podcast. I believe some of that is ours too. And so I I really want to take the time to say thank you uh, to the listeners. Thank you to those of you who watch. Uh, Seriously, without you, none of this is possible. You have put us where we are. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. And until next time, Ben, take us out. Eat them up, cats.